Okay, so the first principle of clean code that I want to look at is avoiding this unnecessary nesting and branching that just makes code super hard to follow. So we have this code that checks if the user is null and if they have a subscription, as well as if they're over 18. If they are, we show the full version of whatever this is. Otherwise, we show some child version. And then we have these else cases to throw an error saying the user needs a subscription and that the user is not found. But this whole thing is just sort of hard to follow. It's hard to tell what even this else goes with because there's so many different if checks. So what we can do instead is try to avoid this nesting by reorganizing the code. So instead of saying if the user is not null and then wrapping everything in this, let's instead invert this to say if the user is null, then we want to throw an error saying no user found. And what this does is first of all, it means we don't need to nest anymore because everything after this, we know there is a user, but also it makes the error code go with the if check so that it's not completely separated on the other side of this massive if. And now we can do the same thing for this one. So we can say if the user has a subscription, but instead of this being user dot has subscription, we want to do the inverse of this. So we're going to say if the user does not have a subscription, then we want to throw this error down here. So I'm going to paste this up here. And now we just have this code left so we can get rid of this if check as well as we can get rid of all of these else cases. And now for this, we can do something very similar if we want. So we can consider this age to be sort of like another spot to early return. So we can say if the user dot age is less than 18, then what we want to do is show the children version. And if we wanted to, we could even make this a return statement so that we don't need an else block. And then we can come down here and we can simply say show the full version once we get past all of this code. So now we have very easy to follow code that doesn't involve any nesting. And by the way, all of the principles in this video should for the most part apply to any programming language. And they're based on real mistakes that I actually made and mistakes that I've seen my students making and that I've just seen a lot of junior developers making. Next, I wanna talk about the idea of ambiguity in code and how we can avoid it. So here we have a check password length function that returns if the password length is greater than or equal to this minimum password, which is six. And there's actually a lot of ambiguity here, even though it seems very simple. So first of all, we have a min password constant, but what does that mean? If you just see the words min password, because remember when we use this, all we have is min password. We can't see anything else unless we go to sort of search for that original code. You can imagine there's a lot in between here. Well, we don't know what min password is. Is this the minimum length of a password or is it something else, some other type of minimum? So let's instead change this to be min password length. That's going to make it just a little bit more clear that min password is actually a number. So this is the number of characters that we need in a password. And then we have this check password length function. And if you just saw this name somewhere where the function is actually invoked, how would you know what this does? Is it throwing an error if this password is not long enough? Is it returning a Boolean? And if it is returning a Boolean, what does true mean and what does false mean? Does true mean it is of the appropriate length or does true mean that it's not of the appropriate length, that it checked it and found a mistake? So what we want to do instead is simply rename this to say, is password long enough? And by doing this, first of all, we have this prefix of is and is says, this is going to return a Boolean. And then is it long enough is going to tell us what true and false means. True would mean that it is long enough and false would mean that it's not. So these simple changes to the code can make it much less ambiguous, which makes it easier to maintain and less error prone down the line from somebody maybe mistaking what the code is meant to do and using it incorrectly. All right, so next we have this function to check if a number is prime. And just by looking at this, you can probably recognize what the issue is. And that's that we are over commenting. These comments are just getting in the way and actually making the code less readable. For example, we have function to check if a number is prime, but that just describes what the function declaration is. It's essentially the exact same line two times, so we don't need this. It's not adding any extra value. Then we say check if a number is less than two. Again, that just describes the line of code. We don't need that. We don't need this one either. But then here we say at least one divisor must be less than the square root so we can stop there. And this is actually a good comment because this is explaining why we are looping to math.square root of number, which if you first looked at this, it might not actually be all of that obvious. I know the first time I saw a function for his prime and I saw this logic, I was actually a little bit confused by this. It took me a minute to understand it. So having a comment 
for this more complicated logic is actually a good thing. But then again, we don't need these comments that are just saying what the code does. We can delete this and we can delete this as well. And then again, we have another check at the bottom that just tells us why we're returning true. But again, we don't need this, so we can simply delete it. That's going to make the code much easier to actually read, and we just have comments in places where they are actually necessary. So in general, try to write self-documenting code, meaning code that is so simple and easy to read that you don't need any comments to explain it, but then use comments to explain any logic that you have that is more complicated that somebody's not going to be able to just look at it and understand why it's there. Next, I want to talk about consistent formatting. So you can see from this example here, we have some very glaring bad issues with the formatting, but there's also some less obvious ones. So first of all, this indentation is just inconsistent. So let's go ahead and fix that so that everything's indented to the same depth for the same sort of nesting level, which in this case is all nested one indent into this function. But then we also have some smaller differences. For example, Around this variable, we have no spaces for the equal sign, which just adds that extra layer of inconsistency and makes the code just a little bit less readable, and these things do start to add up. We're also being inconsistent in using const for this variable here, but let for this variable here. Now, of course, there's times we want const and times we want let, but there's a lot of times where it doesn't matter at all, and generally the rule is to just be consistent. And the thing I've seen the most in industry is actually just using const instead of let, unless you absolutely need something to be reassignable. And then we also have this difference in the quotation marks. So here we use double quotes, here we use double quotes, but here we use single quotes. And here we're using a template literal, which it's fine to use the template literal in some places and single or double quotes in other places, but there's no reason to be using all of them. And if we're going to use the template literal here, we should probably use it here instead of concatenation. So let's actually change that. So let's say here we want to do a template literal like this, and we can end it with the backticks and start it with the backticks here. And generally speaking, I think this is much cleaner than using concatenation, but the most important thing is simply being consistent. Next, I wanna talk about this idea of the dry principle, meaning don't repeat yourself or don't repeat your code. Now, to be clear, this does not mean that you should never have repeated lines of code because that's not the case. But what it does mean is you shouldn't be repeating actual business logic. So the same logic should not exist in two different places for the same purpose. So for example, here we have log login, log log out, and log sign up. And there's just not really a reason to have three different functions for this that all do the exact same thing. So what we can do instead is say function log action, and this can take in some action, and we can say console.log, and then we can use a template literal if we want. So we can say user, and then we'll have our action, which is going to be the string of logged in, logged out, or signed up. And then we can have the rest of this at, and then we'll have that date, so new date. And this is just a little bit cleaner, so we won't need all of these repeated functions. Instead, we can just use this one function that does all of these things. And then if we ever want to change the way these logs look, for example, if we wanted some extra information in all of them, we wouldn't need to go change all of the different functions, we could just change it one time. But again, do be careful with this because we don't want to add too much coupling, meaning we don't want it to be difficult to change something without changing something else. So be very particular about when you apply the dry principles. All right, so next I wanna talk about this idea of failing fast and early, which simply means whenever you know that there is a problem and you're going to need to throw an error or return early, you should do that as early as possible to avoid doing a bunch of unnecessary steps. So for example, we have this get uppercase input function, which takes in some input and it gets the uppercase value of it, assuming it's a string. And if it's not a string, or if it was an empty string, we throw an error. So what we can do here instead of this is take all of this error code and move it to the top because if this happens, we don't need to be doing the two uppercase. And especially if this was some more complex logic, then we would want to be throwing an error as early as possible to avoid that complex logic. And this makes things a little bit simpler because now we know input is actually a string and we don't need all of this optional chaining, which just simplifies the code a little bit. Next, I wanna talk about the idea of magic numbers or just more generally magic values, which are any values that appear in our code that 
are unclear what they mean. Usually these are numbers and strings where they're just hard coded in and it's not clear what their purpose is. And if we just give them names, it's much easier to read that code. So here we check that a transaction type is one. And if it is, we multiply the price by 1.1. And what this actually represents is taxes, but it's very unclear that that's what this is. So let's add some constants. So let's say const taxable transaction type and this is going to be equal to one. We might want to use some kind of enum for this, but for now, this is fine. Then we can also say const tax, and we'll call this a tax multiple. Another way to do this would be to, instead of having 1.1, be like the tax rate of 0.1, and then do the math that way. But either way, this will work. And we can put these values in here. So I'll paste both of these in. It's just going to make this code a little bit easier to read because now, even if you aren't looking at this part of the code, you can look at this and say, okay, this is a taxable transaction. So we are multiplying the price by the tax multiple, which is just going to make it much more clear looking at this code, what it actually does. Okay, so now I have this function that calculates and updates some area and we have the area here. So it's going to be based on some radius. And we can say the new area is math.py times the radius times the radius. And then we update the area. So area equals new area and we return the value as well. And this function has what we call side effects, meaning that running this function changes something globally outside of the function. In this case, this area variable, which is something we generally don't want to do. Additionally, this function is in a way sort of violating the single responsibility principle by doing two things. It's calculating an area based on a radius and it's updating some area. And you can usually tell this simply by having the word and in a function name. So instead of this, let's just say calculate area. And all this is going to do is simply return this math.py times radius times radius. So we can say return like this. And if we did want to update this area, all we would have to do is say area is going to be equal to some call to calculate area, passing in whatever this new radius is, for example, five. And this is just a little bit cleaner because this function now is a pure function that isn't updating anything on its own. But when we return some value from it, we can use that value to update things. Next, I wanna look at two pieces of code that do the exact same thing. So we have this numbers array and we have two different ways to get this filtered result. So what it's going to do is filter out all of the even numbers. So all we want is odd numbers, and then we square all of those numbers. So the first one here is using the reduce function. So it goes through all of the different numbers and it checks if a number is odd using a bitwise and. And if it is odd, what we're going to do is include the previous results in a new array, as well as the current value squared. And if it was even, then we just want to use the previous results and the initial value is simply going to be an empty array. And this does work. So we get one, nine, 25, 49, and 81, which is what you would expect. But a much more readable approach is going to be to simply use filter and map. So first we're going to filter out all of the even numbers. And we're going to use mod instead of the bitwise and, which you might be saying, oh, but that's a little bit less efficient, which to some degree is true, but it's actually not entirely true because a good compiler, including the just-in-time compilation in the V8 engine is going to essentially make these two pieces of code the exact same thing. But additionally, it's just much easier to read. It's very hard to look at bitwise operations and see what exactly they're doing. Whereas I think most people are more familiar with how mod actually works. So this is going to give us just the odd numbers. And then we map over those numbers squaring each one. Now you might be saying, but this is doing two loops and this one just does one. And that is true, but there's actually also extra steps here such as creating all of these new arrays. So I'm actually not even sure if this is more performant, but this code is much easier to read. And honestly, that's usually the more important thing than these sort of micro performance optimizations. And just as a general rule, if you find yourself being clever and thinking, wow, somebody's going to be impressed by this clever logic I came up with, it's probably not good logic. You probably don't want to be doing that. Clever is not a good thing when it comes to programming. You want to have code that's just easy to understand. And that sort of brings us to this next example, which is one of premature optimization, meaning making optimizations before you actually need those optimizations. So here we have an implementation of counting sort, which if you're unfamiliar, is basically a sorting algorithm that's more performant than a traditional sort like merge sort in a case where there is a fixed number of potential values that can be in this input. So for example, here we have only numbers between one and eight. So we can say the minimum is one and the maximum is eight with this array, and that's going to be a more efficient way to sort the array than just using like array.sort. 
But guess what? This is a lot of extra code to maintain. It's a lot of potential bugs that were written by having this extra code. And this array here is not very big. Sorting this array is going to take virtually no time, no matter how we do it. So just use the array.sort function, and then we can make some optimization later down the line if we determine that that sorting is legitimately a bottleneck. But there's no reason to make premature optimizations, make optimizations when you actually need them. But one thing that is worth optimizing for is having good mentorship in your life and in your career. And I have some different opinions on how this should work. So if you're curious about that, you should watch this video next.